Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, SBC 205, whatever time you're consuming this little piece of academic media. Uh, once again, I am your public speaking instructor, Vic McInnes, coming to you live on tape from my COVID-19 compound here in the sprawling Grovetown, Georgia metro area, the Aiken Tech Outpost in Columbia County, Georgia. Hey, today's lecture is brought to you by Registering to Vote. Today, September 22nd, is National Register to Vote Day. And if you're over 18 and a citizen of the United States, there's no reason for you not to be registered to vote. Registering to vote in South Carolina and Georgia are open till October 5th and October 4th, respectively, and you can register to vote online. Remember, if you don't vote, you can't gripe. So go register to vote. Hey, today we got a couple of things we want to do. Uh, first of all, we're going to go over the rubric for your ceremonial introductory speech. Then we're going to talk about audience analysis. So let's go ahead and just jump right into it. Unlike that thing I showed you the other day, which was all sorts of different jacked up, this is the actual rubric I will be using. I moved the PDF over. Okay, so here's how I'm going to be scoring it. The event is worth 50 points. And each of these five areas are worth 10 points each. First thing that you're going to be graded on is 10 points of physical delivery. Now, remember, if I can't see you from head to toe, I can't grade your physical delivery effectively. So if you're not fully framed, if you're if you're doing one of these proof of life videos, or if you're from you know the, the chest up or the waist up, you're not going to get full points for delivery. Okay? So remember, feet are shoulder width apart. Legs are, uh, knees are uh, slightly flexed. Uh, your back is straight, your head is up, your hands are separate, and you gesture to the outside, okay? Uh, and then you look, try to make eye contact with the camera, and remember, don't let the camera sit on the floor. Put it up on a step stool or a chair or something to make it, you know, so again, so it's not looking like you're looming over me, okay? So first of all, topic of speech. If you remember the things I said you need in a ceremonial introductory speech, First thing we need to know is topic of speech. What is the uh, your speaker going to talk about? Okay, real simple. Today, the speaker, John Smith, whatever they are, they're going to be talking to you about. Okay, and just finish that sentence. That is so incredibly easy. The problem we have here is that a lot of students think, well, if I'm talking about Bill Gates, he's clearly going to be talking about computers. And they leave the topic of the speech implied. That is not how you get 10 points. Okay, You need to tell me explicitly that you are what the person is going to talk about. Second things, speaker qualifications. Okay, If you're going to have Bill Gates come up and talk, and he's going to talk about baking, and you talk about the fact that he's invented 43 different computer products, that doesn't tell me anything about what he, how, what he knows about baking. That means he knows about computers, okay? So remember, the speaker's qualifications have to be directly related to the topic of the speech. What I don't want to hear at that point is you reading their Wikipedia entry, okay? I do not need to know everything they did. Let's say you're introducing Alexander Graham Bell, and you wanted to, and he's going to be talking to us today about education of people who have a hearing impairment. Okay, his invention of the telephone has absolutely nothing to do with that topic. Okay, he did a ton of research otherwise on uh, providing assistance to uh, uh, people with hearing impairments, but his telephone invention was ancillary to that. It was not the primary focus. So your speaker qualifications have to be focused on. Uh, uh, what their topic of the speech is. They have to be related. A lot of people will lose points on that or have lost points on that. All you guys are all going to give 50-point speeches, and I'm going to be thrilled. Relevance to the audience. Again, a lot of people will think, well, the audience will know how this is relevant to them, okay? And, and they leave that as implied. And a lot of times, I would just put implied minus 5, and you will get 5 out of 10 points for that, okay? With topic of speech, speaker qualifications, and relevance to audience, here's the simplest way to get 30 points on that. Today, Alexander Graham Bell will be speaking to you about education, educating people with hearing impairments. He is qualified to speak on this topic because, and then you list that. Now, many of us 
know people who are hearing impaired, have family members who are hearing impaired, or have hearing impairments ourselves. So this topic is very relevant to each of us. Okay? It's that simple. Do those three things, that's 30 out of 30. <clears throat> now, time. the time says I originally, I think, said 250 to 310. I'll give you 245 to 315. You get 244, and again, that's not the time on the tape. That's the time you're talking. So the time you spend from turning on the camera to walking to position does not count. You get 244, you get a zero. You get 316, you get a zero. Those are hard cutoffs. I've learned that through experience. That it's just too much of a fight to have people come up and say, well, why did I only get partial credit? Okay. Remember, a couple of things that will cause you to lose points additionally. And these are 10% penalties, so it will be a, 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 a five-point deduction for each of these. Okay. Uh, again, and it's a five-point, it's a 10% deduction for failure to follow instructions. Two, four by, two note cards, no bigger than four by six. If you come out there with an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper or something bigger than four by six, it's going to be five points right there. Okay? I told you, do not introduce a dead person. Do not give us their date of death. All right? Don't do that. If you do that, it's five points. All right? That's all fairly straightforward. If you have any questions, again, I'm going to tell you if you stand with, if you come in and say, Thank you, Bob, for uh, introducing me. If you stand with your feet shoulder width apart, knees slightly bent, back straight, head up, hands separated, one hand holding two four by six note cards, you introduce the topic of what the speaker is going to be speaking about. You tell us how they are qualified to speak on that subject. You give us a statement of you should listen to this speech because, and if you keep it from two minutes and 45 seconds to three minutes and 15 seconds, you just scored 50 out of 50 on this speech. That is, and again, those of you who listen to what I said in the last 45 seconds will get 50 out of 50 or come awfully close to it. Those who do not will, 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 will see that I'm being very serious about that. Okay? It's just that simple. All right, so let's get on to our lecture today. Our lecture today is audience analysis. Okay? Audience analysis is really something that a lot of people don't think about, a lot of people don't, work, don't train on, but here... Let me uh, introduce you to a guy, and as soon as I can get my clicker to click. Okay, uh, hopefully you guys will recognize the person on the left. That's President Ronald Reagan. Uh, the person on the left, the big uh, uh, guy with the bulbous nose, that is Thomas P. Tip O'Neill. Thomas P. Tip O'Neill was a, uh, a member of the House of Representatives from Boston, Massachusetts from 1953 to 1987. These are two of my favorite American politicians of all time, and here's why. They were diametrically opposed on almost every issue that there was out there, but they found they had a very good, friendly relationship. They found they did have a lot of things in common. They found that they could get along and talk. The Speaker of the House of Representatives, who was a Democrat, would regularly go to the White House to have dinner with the President on an informal basis. He would go up to the White House and, and to discuss policy matters, uh, and they'd sit around and, and on, on you know in the living room and have a couple of beers. Okay, but Thomas P. Tip O'Neill, who was Speaker of the House from 1977 to 1987 and a, and a member of the U.S. House of Representatives from 1953 to 1987, said something that I have always, always found to be relevant in public speaking. In America, all politics are local, and that may not seem like it's it may seem like it's more suited for an American government course. But really, when you apply it to public speaking, what that means is your audience is why you are there. And if you can't reach your audience, you are wasting all of your time. If you give the wrong speech to the wrong audience, you've wasted everybody's time. So let me give you a good example. Uh, I, uh, as I've said, worked for a veterans nonprofit here in the CSRA when I first moved up here back in 2015. Uh, we had an event that was honoring uh, veterans who were uh, uh, had served in the global war on terrorism from 2001 to, at that point, 2015. We invited a local member of the House of U.S. House of Representatives to come speak. Um, I'd seen him speak before. He's not a great speaker, but he's usually a pretty good speaker. Uh, he knows how to hit all the, the benchmarks that you need for a veterans group. And he came in, and he was ready to give a speech, happy to do it. And he gave a speech about how... 
what a great generation Vietnam veterans were. Now, I'm not going to tell you that Vietnam veterans aren't great people and they weren't patriotic Americans. But that was not the audience he was talking to. And by the time he finished his 25-minute speech on how great these people's fathers and grandfathers were, the audience had gotten just completely disinterested in whatever he was talking about. Good speech, wrong audience. So you have to consider the audience when you're preparing for your speech. As Tip O'Neill said, you have to make it local. You have to make it relevant to the people there. Okay, The audience is why you're there. They're the purpose for you to either give them entertain, uh, entertain them, to inform them, or persuade them. They're the very reason you were there. You must tune your speech to every single audience because every single audience is completely different. Uh, in the before times, back when we were actually on campus, I used to teach, uh, on average, I taught four sections of public speaking uh, every semester. I'd have two, usually on Monday and Wednesday, they'd start in the middle of the morning, and then the second one would be in the afternoon. And then on Tuesdays and Thursdays, I'd teach one at 8 o'clock and one at 9.35. The classes were always radically different. They fell into general groups. Yeah, the people that came in after lunch and the people that were coming in at 8 o'clock in the morning were a little drowsy. But no two sections were ever identical. And that's one of the things that really bothers me about online teaching is that I don't have a chance to tailor these lectures toward each individual section. Now, I can't tailor it for every individual purpose person, but I can treat the, the sections as a group. And I would modify my lectures based on, on uh, the feedback I was getting after the first week or so of the classes. So every audience is going to be different. You have to demonstrate relevance. Okay? Now, uh, you have to be able to prove to the, your audience that it's something they should care. What you're talking about is something you should care about. Now, if I ask you, those 93 or 4 of you that are left in the class that are listening to this lecture, to tell me where Vanuatu is, you probably would not be able to point to it on a map. In fact, I could probably get to the general region, and I've studied Vanuatu. But it's a very, very small island nation in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. It would be very difficult for you. There's Vanuatu. Vanuatu is probably going to be the first nation that ceases to exist due to global warming. If all predictions hold true, uh, as the ocean levels rise, Vanuatu is an island nation. Its highest point is like 30 feet above sea level. It's just going to disappear. The, the islands will be washed into the ocean and through erosion and natural beach erosion. The nation of Vanuatu is going to disappear. That's a horrible thing. An entire nation's population is going to be displaced. But to be honest with you, you probably don't care. And to be even further honest with you, I probably don't uh, fault you for that. Okay? Because it, it's, it's 8,000 miles away. So global warming, if I'm going to use the, 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 the example of Vanuatu, I'm going to have very little impact. But if I told you that due to rising sea levels, the city of Charleston is going to be flooding. It's flooded like three times in the last five years. These are historic floods of the century, storms of the centuries that have happened multiple times in the last 10 years. And for us to protect Charleston and to ensure that Charleston doesn't get washed into the ocean, it is going to cost the citizens of South Carolina a billion dollars a year. Now, I, I'm making those figures up. It's going to be hundreds of millions of dollars to protect the city of Charleston. And who's going to pay for that? Taxpayers in Aiken County. The whole state's going to have to pay for it. Charleston can't afford that, but the state of South Carolina cannot afford to let Charleston wash into the sea. So the people of the state of South Carolina, for the next hundred years, you're going to be paying more taxes. Okay, how about this? As droughts and the climate shifts, food is going to be significantly more expensive, and so your bill at the grocery store which is already going up, is going to increase, and you're going to be spending 50 to 60% more money on your groceries. How's that? Does that have impact on you? And that, that's a good figure. I've heard that figure from economists. Okay? So we may not care about Vanuatu. It's part of the human condition. I understand that. But really, we need to hear something that's relevant to us. So how do we prove relevance? Well, first of all, we need to prove timeliness. 
Going back to uh, what I said earlier about global warming, and it never really, I mean, it used to be people were saying, hey, global warming is going to wreck the planet in 50 years. You know, somebody told me something right now, the global warming is going to wreck the planet, something's going to wreck the planet in 50 years. I don't know how much concern I can muster. I try to be a good human being, and hopefully I could, but I'm going to be 109 in 50 years. There is, in all likelihood, based on my lifestyle and previous, you know, things that I got going on, I ain't making it to 109. Okay? That's going to be you guys' problem. But if you tell me right now that California is burning and Oregon and, and Washington State are burning and it's going to cost billions for the federal government to help those people recover, that's going to be a big deal. That's happening right now. Okay? Your topic and discussion must be relevant today. It must be relevant to the particular audience you're in front of and not some sort of collective you. You're going to have to deal with this. Well, if you're talking to a bunch of, you know, if you're talking to a senior citizen center, you're going to have to change how you say that. Your grandchildren, your children are going to have to deal with this because if you're telling me i got to deal with that, I'm probably not going to be around for those effects. You have to demonstrate it by proximity. Remember Tip O'Neill's admonition, all politics are local. You have to show that it's going to affect Charleston. It's going to affect you at the grocery store. When you go to the Bilo, did the Bilo's close? Okay, when you go to Kroger, when you go to the IGA, you're going to be paying more money here in the CSRA. Okay? And then you have to demonstrate personal impact. It's going to cost you money, not not the collective. It's going to cost us money, okay? And we're going to talk about how we do that. Use us, not you. It's going to cost us money. We're going to have to pay for it, all right? So one of the things you need to know before you start out, if you're trying to move an audience from A to B, you need to know where A is. So your initial audience dis, uh, disposition is incredibly important to you. Where the audience is when you start, you need to be able to answer that question, at least in broad, general terms. Your job is to move the audience from point A to point B, and the first thing you do and need to do is to find out where they are and then identify some sort of common ground that you can talk on. Okay? You can't demonstrate you understand where they are. How will you be able to show them where they need to be when you're done? It's a pretty straightforward statement. A lot of people forget to do that. So find something everybody can, can agree on. One thing. Okay? And then use that to show commonality and build on that. Build commonality. And see, here's how you do it. Use first-person pronouns. Don't say you. Say we. Say us. Don't say they. Say us. Say we. Build your coalition. Build your group. Ask rhetorical questions, but do not let them hang out there. Okay, We all believe that we should educate our children, right? So let's talk about that. Well, that's something we all believe. But do not give them a chance to answer because some guy in the back is going to go, I don't care. I've, I've seen that happen. Okay, We all believe that crime rates should be lower and everyone should be employed, don't we? So that's what we're here to talk about today. Okay, And then draw on common experience. Everybody hates the Department of Motor Vehicles. Everybody hates going to get their license done, especially now. I mean, everybody has experiences now with COVID-19. Those are all common experiences. Don't talk about COVID-19 in class. That's not a good topic for a speech. But if you want to relate how oogie a mask is and how you don't like wearing it all the time, hey, draw on a common experience. At Aiken Tech, what is, what's a common experience everybody has? Go into the enrollment center. Okay? Uh, in high school, what common experiences that everybody have? Getting a job, what common experiences does everybody have? So use first-person pronouns, ask rhetorical questions carefully, and then draw on common experiences. Your success is going to depend on your personal credibility. Okay? Um, one of my bosses told me one time, I said, I, I don't know anything about what we're, you know, what, about this whole topic. 
And he told me, you don't have to be the smartest person in the room, but damn it, you better be the smartest person on your subject because nobody is going to question you as a subject matter expert on this. And I was like, okay, that makes sense. If I spoke in that room, and usually I'd be in a room, I'd be a civilian in a room full of colonels and generals and admirals and Navy captains. And if I spoke, I needed to move because I had no rank to carry me through. I had only my personal expertise. And my boss told me, you better be the smartest person out there. And everything you said has got to be credible. Because if they ever find out it's not, you're done. Okay? So your personal credibility is of key importance. You have to demonstrate knowledge and expertise, first of all. You have to show that you know what you're talking about. And the way you destroy your credibility is by saying things like, I don't know, maybe it's a big deal. Okay? you got to get all of that out of your vocabulary. Remember we talked about verbal crutches and uh, verbalized pause and vocalized pauses? Those things have got to be getting out. And, and today, the word maybe should just be thrown out of your vocabulary. The, the phrase, I don't know, should be thrown out of your vocabulary. Okay, You have to demonstrate knowledge and expertise, and you have to demonstrate that your confidence in your knowledge and expertise. You have to establish trustworthiness and be personable. Remember when we talked in... Uh, we've been talking about this the whole time. Dialogic theory. Be act animated. Act like you care. Okay? If you're just up there going like, nah, I don't care why I'm here. I, I really, I'm just being forced to do that. This. Okay? I really, I wish I could leave. People are going to pick up on that and you're not going to be credible. The thing you need to remember, if we go back and talk, remember we talked about Aristotle and Socrates and all those dead Greek guys. You have to create ethos. Modern research has proven Aristotle had it right from the get-go. You are more informative. You are more persuasive. You are considered a better speaker if you create ethos. And remember, you may go in there and say, I'm an expert on this. But if the audience doesn't believe it, you don't have any credibility. So ethos isn't you. It's what the audience thinks of you. It is based on your interactions with the audience. Remember, I say this over and over again. You have to engage the audience. You have to be in a dialogue with the audience. And reading your speech written word for word does not give you credibility. It shows you can read. And that's it. doesn't show that you're an expert with a command of the subject. So, what are our sources of ethos? Real simple. Competence, trustworthiness, similarity, attraction, and sincerity. Okay? The audience has to know or believe that you know what you're talking about, that you can be trusted to give them good facts, that you have a lot in common with each other, that there is an attraction, and I don't mean a physical attraction, I mean an attraction to the way you present yourself, okay? And that's not based on physical beauty, that's based on your, your, your engagement, that's based on your, uh, 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 your nonverbal communication, and then they have to believe you're sincere. I mean, if you say, if we do this, the economy of the United States is going to really explode, they're not gonna, you're not seen as sincere, okay? So, let's talk about the nuts and bolts of how we do audience analysis. Theoretically, you should try, and I don't know why I capitalized Taylor. I guess they thought I was talking about some guy named Taylor. You can't tailor your message to each audience member, so you have to sort of look at them as a whole. Uh, and here's how we do that. First of all, there's demographics. and Everybody understands demographics. It's where you break things down statistically. Number of people that have high school diplomas. Number of people that have some college. Or percentage of people that have college degrees. Uh, you can break it down by ethnicity. You can break it down by uh, income. You can break it down by education. You can break it down by religious affiliation. You can break it down by uh, types of employment. You can break it down by any number of ways. Great source of that is the U.S. Census Bureau because they have, you can go to the U.S. Census Bureau uh, and look at uh, Aiken County. They break everything down by counties, and it's a really good tool for that. So demographics, you could break it down and sort of get an idea of who they are and identify some things. It can be purpose-oriented. Why are they there listening to your speech? What's their purpose? Not your purpose, their purpose. Um, 
what about my audience is important to the purpose of my speech? What do I need to know about why they're there to help me accomplish what I want to accomplish? What are the listener motivations? What are their emotions? What's the occasion that I'm speaking at? Okay, All these things roll into purpose-oriented analysis. Then there's psychographic. Psychographic involves values, opinions, attitudes, and beliefs of the audience. Okay, So if you're talking to the Republican Party of Aiken County, you already know what some of their ideas are. It's, it's a public, you can go to their website and check out what their public statement of their beliefs are. If you're going to speak at a church group, <clears throat> you can probably find stuff about the church group on their website. And if nothing else, when you get asked to give the speech, hey, tell me about your group. What are they, well, what, what's important to the group? What do they value? What, well, what are their opinions on the topic that I'm going to be discussing? Okay, What kind of attitudes do they have about this subject? Okay, And here's where you can get it from. You can get it from mass media. These days, I don't care if you're giving a talk in Portland. I can get on and watch the local Portland, uh, uh, Portland Maine. I probably didn't even know there was a Portland, Maine. I can go read the local newspaper in Portland, Maine right now on my computer and check out their mass media. I can look at the local TV and radio stations from here on the Internet. So that's a great tool. Uh, background on the organization that you're talking about. The Lions Club. What do the Lions Club do? What do they represent? The Civitans. Okay, the Junior League, all these groups, What? how long have they been here? What do they do? How? What, what, what kind of things are they proud of? Look at their websites. The U.S. Census Bureau, we've already discussed. And then there's first-person resources. Call somebody up and ask them. I, I know people now don't like using, I know, I know, uh, you millennials, I know you guys don't like to use your phones for phones, but they do work with for voice communication. They can be very effective that way. And then public opinion polls. Now, be very careful about a pu public opinion poll. I say this over and over again. First of all, number one, we're being flooded with public opinion polls. Every day it's got a new poll out, some battleground state or something. But when a, a reasonable, uh, good polling organization like Gallup comes out and says, President Trump is trailing in the election 54 to 46, eight points nationally. There's 330 million people in the United States, and Gallup probably interviewed less than 2,000 people to come up with that statement. Okay, and then there's some other stuff within. If you ever want to get really get um, um, lose all faith and credibility in opinion polls, take a, a a class on survey research methods, and you come up with this thing that they call chi. They multiply and figure things by chi, which is a figure that they just made up one day. Somebody was looking at a bunch of opinion polls, and then they went back and looked. Here's the vote. Here's the opinion polls. How far were they apart? And they came up with this number called chi, and they said, if we multiply by chi, that'll give us our reasonable uh, 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 margin of errors. And if you look at some public opinion polls, and they say a, a plus or minus 3%, I saw one the other day that's plus or minus uh, uh, 7%, okay? That's a 14% swing, okay? So... Just be aware of that. All right, make sure you adjust your sources and supporting material. Change your organization if you need to. Watch for feedback from the audience. Okay? Uh, so the example I use is if we're going to build a new wing on Aiken uh, Regional Hospital, I'm giving three speeches in three days. First one is going to be to the Chamber of Commerce, which is all the business people in Aiken County. Second speech is going to be to nursing students at Aiken Technical College. Third is going to be to a bunch of bankers in New York, and we're going to have to we're going to uh, 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 be asking them for money to help build it. Okay, so talking to the Chamber of Commerce, the business guys, what am I going to talk about? Jobs. I'm going to talk about money coming into the economy. I'm going to get them to support our our ideas by telling them it's going to improve your money flow. More people will be coming to your restaurant. More people will be moving to the area. You're going to have more people uh, uh, coming to your air conditioning uh, service firm. You're going to make more money because you're businessmen. That's what you care about. To the Aiken Tech students, nursing students, I'm going to tell you, we're going to hire 400 nurses in the next three years, and you can get a job at the new Aiken uh, Regional uh, Medical Center wing. That's it, just jobs. And for the guys in New York, what are they going to want to hear about? When are you going to be able to pay my loan back? Okay? I'm going to loan you $120 million. How quickly are you going to get it back to me? That's what they're going to care about. 
Okay, you may need to change your organization. You may need to change the evidence you're using. You may need to change. You know, uh, you may watch for feedback and realize that maybe you need to tweak the organization as you go through. All of those are going to be very important, but it will change for every single audience. Okay. Last thing, graphics. Check out the here. Let's do that again, man. Put a lot of effort into those graphics. Audience analysis is an ongoing process. It never stops. Just because you've walked, finished your speech and walked out of the room, you should reach back to that organization that asked you to speak and say, hey, listen, how did it go? How do you think it went? What do you think I could have improved on? Did the audience like it? Give me honest feedback. Okay? Because you may not ever speak to that audience again, but you're going to be speaking to audiences again. So it's going to be a good idea for you to have some idea about how they reacted so you can put that into your toolbox. So audience analysis is an ongoing process that never stops. That is incredibly important. Okay, that is our lecture for today. Remember, seriously, in all seriousness, uh, uh, November 3rd is going to be a massive election for this country. Uh, it's going to be historic. Um, we've already got people on, on both sides of the aisle trying to say that the election is going to be uh, all jacked up. And the way we uh, keep it from doing that is everybody goes out and votes. Okay, One of the things I want you to be doing here in the next uh, uh, six weeks uh, before the election is listening and applying what you're learning here in that and if you're registered to vote, you can actually take those lessons you're learning here and apply them out in the real world by deciding who you're going to vote for. There's a lot of elections coming up. and I mean, we're electing two senators in, in Georgia. You're electing one in uh, North Carolina. We're electing a new president, a new vice president. The entire House of Representatives is up. And if you're not registered to vote and if you don't use that uh, uh, right you have, you have no control over what's going on. And when it goes wrong and you don't like the way things are going, you don't have anything to say about it because you passed on your opportunity to get involved in the process. Okay? So you've got till October 4th or 5th. You can register online in both South Carolina and Georgia. Go do that if you haven't already. If you're going to request a absentee ballot, uh, the deadline for that is coming up in both states. Early voting starts in a, uh, just a week or two here in uh, Georgia. I think it starts about the same time in South Carolina. So the election is upon us. I got my absentee ballots in the mail on Monday. So um, let's get that done. Go register to vote. Stay safe. Stay well. Don't forget to email me any questions you may have. Don't forget that your ceremonial introductory speeches are due Friday at 8 a.m. And we will see you soon.